Welcome back, everybody. You're back here with Shout Learning, and this is the Shout Online Conference Series. My name is Jonathan, and I've been looking forward to this gathering all day as we've been through three amazing prior sessions. We've been building towards this session, which we're calling You're the Interviewer. Um, arguably, this is my chance to, to be a little bit quieter and let you do all the question asking. Uh, I'll jump in and just try to help uh, share your questions with our panel today, but the people that we are featuring today are no strangers to the Shout Online Conference Series. In fact, all of them have taken part in one way or another, and uh, you've asked for them to come back. When we say by popular demand, we indeed, you have told us, please bring them back. I have more questions, so I hope you will share those questions with us. Um, each person brings a perspective ranging from the lab to the forest, uh, to the soil, to the classroom, uh, to the tigers. Um, and uh, we're going to hear a little bit about what's on their mind these days, what kind of work they're doing since maybe they checked in with us last, and, um, and certainly hear about your questions. Now, some of you are new and may not have been to every session, and I thought it might be useful before we got started to actually turn to each person to have them introduce themselves, and they can tell you a little bit about what they are up to. Oh, and don't forget, we also have with us Chris, who is our artist, and he is going to capture all of your questions and comments uh, as best as he can in the form of an illustration. So we'll check in with Chris to uh, help keep us on track as we look at his drawing, which you're seeing just starting or budding at the top of the screen. So I'm going to go ahead first, and and uh, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to actually go to the Go to where am I going to go first? Let's go to the Tigers first. Uh, Anna, uh, Anna Tinsler is joining us, um, and maybe she can go ahead and uh, just introduce herself and say hello. Hi, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say how honored I am to be a part of this great experience and be on the panel with so many distinguished people. So thank you. Um, I am part of the Smithsonian's Tiger Conservation Partnership, and I am the program specialist. Um, so I do a lot of coordinating and, and working at all different levels within the program. Um, I'm really excited to announce, though, that recently we have a new director, Dr. Mahendra Shrestha, and um, he will be leading us throughout our capacity building programs. Um, one of our most exciting things that's coming up in November is a uh, protected area management training. Um, we're going to be collaborating as part of the Global Tiger Initiative with Thailand's Department of National Parks, Wildlife, and Plant Conservation, and as well as the Wildlife Conservation Society to run this training in uh, Thailand's Western Forest, forest Complex. Um, we will be inviting participants from priority protected areas that are important to tiger conservation to join us in this training, and we hope to help them um, in, in, enhance their skills, and particularly smart patrolling. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about that training as well as any of the other topics we covered in my previous uh, presentation. Thanks, Anna. That's pretty exciting, and we love um, opportunities for people to get involved and uh, the open invitation for questions. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the Global Tiger Initiative, we'd love to hear your questions, so feel free to drop right in. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, turn uh, our attention over to Alex Griswold, who was on one of our most recent Shout sessions. And uh, Alex is going to remind us uh, about a really great opportunity for us to get involved in being part of capturing history. Alex. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And, and again, thank you for including me in this uh, conference. It's, it's nice to be back. Um, this summer, uh, we introduced the idea of an oral history challenge, which is um, a chance for the shop community to have students go and record interviews with people in their local areas who've been influenced by land use changes or have seen deforestation with their own eyes or, or seen or are affected by these potential changes. And we prepared a short video. There's a frame from the video on screen right now that tells you exactly how to do this and how to get started. And there are other resources for this available on the um, shoutlearning.org website. So I'm really looking forward this fall to seeing some of the videos. And after we've seen them, uh, we will post some of them up online, and you'll be able to share them with the rest of the community. So again, thanks very much for including us, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about this program as the day goes on. <laughs> and uh, one question for you, Alex, is as people think about doing oral history 
projects, especially ones that relate to the environment, what are some sort of conversation starters or idea starters that you might suggest to them to, as they scan their local environment, their local neighborhood, how, how should they identify the, the right people to be interviewing? Well, I think you can start with people that you know. You don't have to go up to strangers or people who um, may, may be, seem very in, inapproachable, but sometimes people in your own family have seen uh, land use changes or people who work in, um, in the land or in the forest some way, uh, forest rangers, um, the uh, farmers even, and sometimes even people who do things that are related but not necessarily that the first thing that would come to mind, like fishermen who are affected by silting of rivers or of coastal areas that might be caused by uh, deforestation. Um, and you can also look at people who've done wonderful things to try to preserve land or who are currently working to preserve land. And the one thing that I think everyone will find is that the people are happy to tell their stories. Everybody is really an expert about what they've experienced and what they've seen and um, if you just show that you're interested and listen carefully and let them talk, they'll, they'll be happy to respond. And I think most of the people that we've interviewed, in fact, I can't think of anyone who said, oh, I'm really sorry you interviewed me. It's always the opposite. They say, wow, you made me think about some things I didn't even think about. Well, that was really, really valuable for me. And the people who hear the interviews can then be, uh, you know, part of that conversation, too. So... I, you know, it's, I've seen it um, with a lot of students who've done this, and I think it's a wonderful thing, and I really encourage everyone in the shop community to, to give it a try if you, if you find you can fit it in. It is amazing what happens when you simply ask a question and sit back and, and listen to the story that unfolds. So, um, so good. We'll, we'll come back to you uh, in, in a few moments, Alex. I wanted to actually introduce two people next, um, uh, Gary Krupnik and Bill McShay, both of whom were part of uh, the Shout series in this last year. And um, Gary, you, you've, you've um, alerted us during your session to the disappearance of plants that some of us didn't even know existed to begin with. And during the series of events, we've uh, discussed the disappearance of animals that live in places that some of us will actually never even get to. And meanwhile, um, Bill McShay um, discussed an opposite problem, too many of a species uh, right here in the United States. And so I have a, an open question to both Bill and, and to Gary and to others as well is, if we're not directly affected by environmental changes like this, what do you say to people who who don't seem to care? Uh, should, well, I'll go we first. Care? Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Uh, this is Gary. Um, I, I work over at the uh, National Museum of Natural History here in Washington, D.C., uh, where I plant, uh, direct the plant conservation unit, and I use herbarium specimens uh, to understand uh, how many species were in a given spot and in a given time and to see how those changes have occurred. And uh, within our collection, we have several uh, plant specimens um, that are uh, representative of extinct species. And some of these species, yeah, you will never see. They don't have any direct impact on you or your life. But they were once part of a food chain. And once you take out one piece of that, that web, the whole web fa fa falls apart. Pollinators that used to go to that plant don't have that plant anymore, and so they are without those resources. Um, when, when you take out top predators, it affects the herbivores, and so the herbivores are in overabundance, which are affecting the, the amount of plants that are around. And so it, 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 this huge food web, um, and, and when those pieces are removed, the whole system can fall apart. And so you might not realize that you are being directly impacted by it directly, but many years down the line, there might be some sort of evidence that, that might affect you. Um, yeah, this is Bill McShay. I, I'd agree with everything Gary said, and it's, it's a matter of there are very few things that impact you directly, but indirectly, many of the animals and plants we're talking about do affect you, and those indirect effects are not obvious all the time, but they do make a significant difference. These, things, these animals and plants are cleaning the air and cleaning the water and providing food networks for other animals and plants, and that's important. And 
those things do have an impact on you. And for some of these organisms, we don't know what their impact is yet. We don't know if there's a, a medicine there that, that would cure cancer or uh, one of these animals will control an invasive species that we want to control that does impact us directly. We don't know those things yet. And if we lose these animals and plants, then we'll never know. And somebody who has an important, a very important job um, is, is helping to share that story and that impact that we can have um, and how everything is interconnected. And that person is Cheryl Arnett, who's a teacher who uh, has been part of the SHOUT program. And she's been trying to connect these important stories and uh, studies and topics with her students. And maybe Cheryl, we first of wanted to thank you for uh, appearing on this side of the virtual uh, event today and for the good work that you've been doing in the classroom. Maybe you could tell us where you are, um, a little bit about your students, and, and how you've been drawing a connection to these projects. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. It is fun to be on this side. I have second grade students in Craig, Colorado. It's a rural community in, nor in the northwestern part of the state. We attended quite a few of the sessions last year, and we found each time, even though my children are, are pretty young, that when they would listen to a story of a global problem or a faraway United States problem, there were always connections back to something for us here. And Bill McShay's project about the deer brought home a, project, a problem that we had right here in our community. And one of the great things about that is that it, it allowed me as a teacher to realize that I could let go of some of the old units that I had always, always done and go to something that was current and relevant and meaningful to the kids. And along with what Alex said about the oral histories, we also discovered that our community is full of wonderful expert people who also are anxious to and very happy to come in and teach the kids. I didn't have to be the expert. We could bring in local people, the mayor, the Division of Wildlife. We used the National Forest Service, the BLM. We had all kinds of people come in and talk to the kids and teach them about the local connection to the bigger problems that we learned about through SHOUT. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, I, it, as I as I've learned about the work that you've been doing and the, the local connections you've been making, I thought maybe we would ask our our fellow participants today who are some of the people in their community who'd uh, be able, or as you put it, even proud to come in and meet with the students. It, I think as you and you drew a connection to Ar what Alex was saying about people being just pleased to be asked, right? Yes. Um, what are some of the, uh, either some priceless facial expressions among your students as they're looking on at some of the experts, what are some of the uh, either anecdotal or, or project-based work that's resulted from their involvement? We had, one of the things that we did as we thought about the forest, we live in a, kind of a high country desert area. The, the forest in Colorado is up in the mountains a few miles from where we are. So we have a lot of sagebrush and cottonwood trees here. But we found out that if we started looking at the ancient forest, that there used to be a rainforest here from talking to a local miner. And even as, as a grown-up, I didn't realize this when I called the mine, that they have found in our coal mine here actual fossils. He came in, a, a representative from the mine came to our class and brought fossils that the kids could put their hands on. It was just amazing. Some of them were too large, and he brought pictures of uh, big tropical leaves that they found at the mine, and to, for the kids to imagine that this used to be a place filled with water and tropical forests was just beyond their imagination. They also see the dying forests around Colorado from the pine beetles, and the man from the Forest Service came in with actual pine beetles for the children to touch and cross sections of the trees so they could see the blue stain around the outside. It, it was very a, a very good lesson for the kids, for me, and they've talked about traveling and noticing it and mentioning it to their families after the learning they did here in the classroom. Bill, as, as you hear Cheryl talk about the impact of attending uh, your webinar, uh, any, any thoughts that you come to mind? I wish Cheryl was my teacher <laughs> when I was going to school. It sounds like a great class. It sounds like everything you hope science, that science is really exploration, and it doesn't always come across that way. And that class sounds like a lot of fun. It, 
It does. <laughs> it does. I'm glad we have both of you in real time here together to to to, uh, to chat. I also want to bring in from re in real time. Uh, Sunshine, Sunshine Von uh, Bell, who's with us today. I'm not sure if her mom's logged in today, as she was during her prior <laughs> webcast, but it's good to hear your voice again, Sunshine. Maybe you could tell everybody, uh, update everyone on what you're up to and where you are, because I think you're the furthest from the from the, the mall in Washington today. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. It's great to be here again. Um, so yes, my name is Sunshine Van Bell. Um, I'm a community ecologist, and I have been living in Panama for the last um, 10 years or so, and I'm very interested in interactions between plants and animals and people, um, and I also do some work with um, fungi. I didn't include that in my past presentation, but I'm also interested in interactions between plants and fungi. So um, I'm especially concerned about the ecosystem services that we get from different interactions um, and symbioses between different groups of organisms. And um, I'm also, you probably remember from my previous presentation, very concerned about how food is produced, especially in tropical areas, because the production of food is competing with the conservation of tropical rainforests and their biodiversity. So I'm very interested in working with farmers to find ways that they can um, change their behaviors or improve the way that they grow food so that both aims can be accomplished, so that food can be produced but biodiversity conserved at the same time. You gave some, uh, among many other really amazing examples, you, you talked about um, coffee production uh, during your last session. Maybe you could just share a couple of uh, positive or any promising things going on in that regard. Sure. Well, the main thing to pay attention to when you hear about both coffee and chocolate are um, whether or not it's being growed, grown underneath the shade of tropical forest trees. So you may have heard of shade-grown coffee or shade-grown chocolate. Now, both of these crops grow under the shade of rainforest trees, but unfortunately in some areas people have decided to just start growing them out in the sun and forgetting the shade part. And the reason the shade part is so important is because it um, provides a lot of habitat. The shade trees provide a lot of habitat for birds and mammals and bats and insects and plants and orchids and all of these organisms that um, would, would not have a place to live if everybody began growing their coffee and their chocolate out in the sun. So um, the other main thing that we're concerned about is conversion of land to pasture. Um, throughout the world, that seems to be one of the biggest driving factors for deforestation. So we're also very interested in how we can get more trees back into pastures and working with different groups to look at silvopastoral systems. Silvopastoral combines both trees and um, pastures so that it's not just cows we're raising, but we're also providing habitat for other important species that are important um, for keeping the community in balance and for ecosystem services in, in tropical areas. Sunshine, um, you know, a lot of the discussions around the environment uh, often emphasize the negative, the degradation of our ecosystems, the endangerment of species like tigers and many others. I'm wondering if either you or anyone else uh, who's on our call, and we still have some more people to introduce, so maybe we'll invite one of them to jump in as well. Do any of you have any favorite stories of positive change, of ways where we've made improvements in our treatment of the environment and we should be replicating and amplifying those stories? This is uh, well, John Thompson. I'll I have an idea. Uh, sure, we'll, we'll do Jonathan, then we'll, we'll jump to Anna, I think that was. Okay, I'm Jonathan Thompson. I've yet to be introduced, um, but I'm a landscape ecologist, and I mostly work in the northeast part of the United States. And thinking about something positive is uh, the entire reforestation of the northeast United States. If you look back to about 1850, about the time... Thoreau was writing Walden, the, most of the northeastern landscape, upwards of 80%, was in pasture. And since then, we've had this historic reforestation, which really, uh, it's 
sort of the second chance to decide what we want to do with our forests. And so unlike what Sunshine was talking about, where around the world forests are being converted to pasture, in the Northeast we, uh, we did that, and then the citizenry moved to the urban environments and the forests have grown back. And, and that trend continued from 1850 right about to about the year 2000, and now it's starting to turn downward again, and again we're starting to lose forests. So here we're at this precipice in my mind where we get to decide, do we want to um, go with what will be a hard deforestation this time, or do we want to decide to conserve our forests and all the benefits they provide? And somebody else would think, thank you, Jonathan, and somebody else was going to jump in there too. Sure, that was me actually. Um, I will just jump in there and, and kind of echoing what Jonathan has said. It is also suggested that in Central America and South America, in lots of areas, forests will begin to reclaim pastures, along with the trend of people moving into the cities. And one of the amazing things we're finding out as we as we look at these trends and suspect that they may occur in other places as well is that we really have very, very little understanding of the organisms that live in secondary forests. So in Panama in particular, the Smithsonian has been here for decades um, collecting tons and tons of information about the organisms in primary tropical rainforests, but we know hardly anything about the organisms that are living in forests that are regenerating and coming back. And there are plenty of those forests around um, in all different stages of succession. So um, one part of my research, and there are also lots of other researchers at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute right now, who are trying to get a better understanding of the ecology of secondary forests and to what extent they're going to provide habitat for how many species. Um, but I also wanted to jump in with a positive story. Um, um, I'm noticing um, with the, the more and more I get interested in the silvopastoral systems, um, I'm hearing more and more about communities um, throughout Panama who understand um, that we're at a very, are beginning to understand that we're at a very crucial juncture in terms of how the land is being converted to pasture. Now, generally, or traditionally, the way that land is converted into pasture is through burning and burning releases lots of fossil fuels, and it's, it's bad for the environment for lots of different reasons. Um, and so slowly, lots of communities are beginning to understand that this is not a sustainable practice. And this is because they're being forced to move generation after generation. Their land is getting depleted, and they're realizing that the system isn't working. So um, I'm very encouraged by this movement into civil sustainable silvopastoral systems where um, they are figuring out ways that they can begin pastures without burning, that they can incorporate a lot of trees, and that the cows, instead of focusing all of their feeding on grasses, are beginning to eat bushes and trees and plants, which can regenerate quickly. And these are all plant species that were originally part of the forest anyway. We're just bringing them out and growing more of them to um, create feed for the cattle. So I'm very, very encouraged by um, the communities that are beginning to do this um, through, throughout Panama, also in Costa Rica and in Colombia. And I want to open the, the, the floor up to any panelists who'd like to jump in on anything they've heard, anything Sunshine yeah. just said. Yeah, go right ahead. Hi, sorry, this is Anna. Um, I just got, I really appreciated uh, Sunshine's comment about communities and public awareness. Um, the point I wanted to make is that, you know, engaging communities and having uh, better, more public awareness for these, for conservation issues is important because um, it can involve more government, involve, it can involve more government support and more political will. Um, and a really good example of that would be uh, the International Tiger Forum that was hosted in St. Petersburg in November last year, 2010. Um, there was an unprecedented collaboration between um, the Tiger Range countries where heads of state came together and um, created a declaration where they all agreed on the next steps on how they would move forward to protect tigers and their habitats. And so I think it's really important, you know, community engagement, involving the government, increasing political will, all of these things I think are essential uh, for conservation initiatives to move forward. You know, Anna, one of the questions that has come up from our participants in the SHOUT series 
um, relates to the role of humans in the ecosystem. Um, we've, we've learned a lot about the role that different species have and, and the vital roles they play within the ecosystem. And Bill, for example, you um, talked about the crucial role uh, played by oak trees and specifically their acorns to the animals of the Appalachian forest. So when we talk of ecosystems, where does the human species come in? Um, do we play any vital role? Anyone want to take well, that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please go right ahead. Um, well, I'm not sure if somebody else might want to answer that question in a, in a more broad uh, perspective, but uh, in, in, from my perspective, I think, you know, it's hard to look at it with, with tigers in a, in a positive view, humans' role, because I immediately think of poaching or encroachment on protected areas, um, but humans do play, uh, obviously, an, an important role, um, but I'm not sure if somebody wants to come in with a more positive view on that. Well, I, I wouldn't mind adding a positive spin here. Um, of course, humans have been um, played play probably the most negative role in, in terms of uh, ecosystem uh, destruction and habitat loss. Um, but without humans, those plants and those animals that have been on the verge of extinction um, have been able to be, been able to brought back from the verge of extinction to, to become very healthy populations. Um, I wish I had a slide of it, but I'm thinking of a, uh, a specific plant, Erica verticillata, which is a heath plant species from uh, South Africa. And uh, we all thought this plant went extinct uh, back in the 1940s. The last herbarium specimen we have is from uh, 1943. Um, back in the 1980s, uh, 40 years later after that, um, there were some herbarium specialists working in a herbarium noticing this plant that we thought was extinct from South Africa and did a very extensive search and found one individual plant that was still alive in a botanical garden outside of um, South Africa and found another living, herbarium, uh, living plant species in a Royal Botanical, garden queue, uh, Royal Botanical Gardens queue in London. And so here we have two individual plants that we thought were extinct that went unidentified in botanic gardens, and we were able to cross-pollinate them, produce enough seeds, and now there are about two or three very, very ha healthy populations uh, that have been reintroduced to South Africa. And so in that aspect, humans are playing a very vital role in preventing uh, certain species from going extinct. I would, I would jump in and say that that people don't necessarily have to pay a negative role. And if you take Jonathan's example of the Northeast, all the time that that forest was growing, the population of the Northeast was actually growing also. And it's just a matter of people treating forests differently. And Southeast Asia is an area that has had high human densities for millennia. And they, they still maintain tigers and elephants and lots of really wonderful things. So it's not necessarily true that when we get a lot of people, we've got to lose the wildlife. When we get a lot of people, we have more wildlife conflicts and we have more problems, but we can work it out if we had the will. Well, I, I think I'd like to jump in and say that, you know, in working on uh, environmental science uh, films and videos and interviewing experts in the field, that one of the things that I learned and I, I, it was surprising to me and I imagine to a lot of people is that, you know, we often think of the um, ecosystem as being out there, that you have to go on a field trip or something to go see the ecosystem. And, and actually, uh, all of us, all humans are part of the ecosystem. It's not something outside. It, it's us and we're, we're, we're part of it. And, um, you know, it's sort of that kind of shift, I think, is taking a while. But I, you certainly see that when, um, you know, the students start to look at these questions and, and think about them. Absolutely. And speaking of questions, we would love to take your questions. So please do jump in and, uh, and share as we go along. And somebody else was going to jump in. Go for it. I was going to add uh, right along that line with the children, one of the, the most successful projects we did last year had to do with the webcast from Borneo that Taking It Global did about the orangutans. And my seven-year-olds quickly became readers of labels looking for palm oil. They found it in products here in our own lunchroom at school and were able to work with food service to try to eliminate those products and take some sort of action. I think children are a big key to that. And if adults and, and people are going to have an effect on preventing 
plants and animals from becoming extinct. It needs to start in childhood, and I think that you folks are all doing a wonderful job of providing these programs to help educators bring this message to the kids. It's a, a great, a great, um, uh, it's amazing to see how students, what it is that allows a student to kind of hook their, their mind around uh, these topics and bring it home. And uh, of course the role that you play in doing that, Cheryl, is, is uh, indispensable. Um, I, in the course of the work that all of you do from each of your perspectives, I'm wondering if you think of your work in terms of conservation for the sake of future generations or do you think uh, in terms of stewardship of nature, uh, sort of a, an obligation to the planet itself as, as, a, as a creation? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Cons conservation versus stewardship? It's a big one. <laughs> it is a big one. I'll, I'll say this part in that I love being in wild places. I love seeing wildlife. And I want other people to have that same experience. And I want to do what I can to make sure other people can enjoy what I enjoy. And that can be someone down the block or it can be my kids or my grandkids. And I just want other people to see and experience what I've been able to experience. And I'm trying to do my part to make sure that happens. Thank you, Bill. Um, other thoughts? It comes across better when, when you speak. Oh. I should. I was just going to add it, it. It certainly comes across when you speak to others, Bill, about your about your desire for people to uh, to appreciate what you do. So I want to thank you for that. Yes, go right ahead. This is Jonathan. I, I was just the distinction between stewardship and conservation. I. They go so hand in hand, I think that's why we all got quiet when you <laughs> asked the question. But it, to me, I guess conservation in, in a way um, implies that things aren't changing and that we're going to conserve things the way they are. And in that sense, I guess I lean towards stewardship. It's the, the forests I work in are polluted and the trees are stunted and they're full of invasive species and there's no top predators, but on the other hand, it's it's teeming with life. It's home to all kinds of native species and has all these ecosystem functions that we all rely on and uh, it stores carbon and cycles nutrients and cleans the water and cleans the air and in that sense, we want to um, steward that and allow that to happen, but it, it really is uh, about conservation in some of its um, most traditional senses and trying to keep, for me, it's about keeping forests in, in forests and keeping them from becoming something else categorically while acknowledging that they're always changing and that they're never going to be like what they were and uh, understanding them in the future is a real challenge. I want to, um, I've been waiting to have this, uh, the opportunity to do this, but if I'm not mistaken, during uh, Gary's talk, he talked about, I'm going to get the phrase wrong, but um, I'm paraphrasing, something kind of like uh, when you're talking about plant life, you don't have the benefits of, of, uh, of uh, adorable giant megafauna. Did I get that? Um, right? Yeah, well, the, the terminology, I think, is um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the megafauna, the charismatic megafauna. Charismatic megafauna, that's what it was. So I wanted to put you and Anna together. Uh, Anna is looking after tigers and trying to tell their story, and, um, and you are looking at uh, plants. Um, and um, and what, 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 how can you help each other get your messages out? Uh, great question. Um, you know, I, w when we talk about the charismatic megafauna, it are, is those tigers or the panda or um, something that Humans initially relate to other animals. They have eyes, they have feet, they walk around. They're a lot like them. And so when they see that they are threatened, they want to do, if they, they are interested in conservation, that's where they donate their money. And when you see a little plant that looks quite weedy or um, a tiny little herb growing somewhere else, there's a lot less uh, vested interest in, in saving something like that. And I, I think what it comes down to is, is just trying to conserve entire ecosystems. The tigers live in the forests 
with all these other species. And when we try to save one, we're trying to save all of them within one given area. Um, and so as a conserva plant conservation biologist, my, my main message to get out there is that, yes, there are plenty of endangered species. And sometimes they take the form of a bald eagle, and sometimes they take the form of a small little cactus. And every single one has its role in the environment, and it's important to, to focus on all of them. Yep. I, I agree with you 100%, Gary. And I, I think that, you know, the bottom line is bio, biodiversity is also key to our survival, and that, you know, the tiger is just one part of a huge system. Um, and that, you know, if, if the tiger is what most peop more people respond to, then why not um, have that benefit the rest of the, of the, of the, rest of the ecosystem, the rest of the biodiversity? And I wanted to turn back to Sunshine uh, joining us in Panama. Sunshine, um, a lot of people uh, don't realize that um, where you are at STRI, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, is part of the Smithsonian and that, um, and that uh, the collection of institutions or, or units that make up the Smithsonian include places outside of Washington, D.C. And, and the immediate area. Can you talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, uh, some of the things that you think more people should know about uh, that might affect, from your research, that might affect what's going on back here, for example, in the United States? Well, um, yes, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute is actually the only branch of the Smithsonian Institute that's um, not um, in United States, on United States land. Now, it used to be because the U.S. used to um, own or maintain five kilometers in either direction of the Panama Canal, and so that's how the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute got its start down here in Panama. But then in 1999, when the canal was handed back to the Panamanian government, um, we, the Smithsonian, came to all kinds of agreements with the Panamanian government for us to stay here. Um, and to continue our long-term research on tropical ecosystems. Um, lessons from my research, well, the best connections that I can make super easily with what goes on in temperate forests, um, you said up here, I, I imagine you, you, you meant Washington, D.C., is that um, down in Panama we get a, a yearly um, influx of migratory bird species. And so these are the same bird species that are um, making their nests um, in the backyards up in temperate areas during the summertime and, and having their babies there in the yards and in the forests. And then each winter they fly down to Panama to find food during the coldest months up north. And um, what I've found in my research, and actually this research is connected with another part of the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, is that the migratory birds who come down to Panama and other parts of Central America and South America don't necessarily depend on primary forests, primary tropical forests, once they get here. And in fact, a lot of those species are actually really um, enjoying and um, ha uh, maintaining high populations in agricultural systems, especially shaded agricultural systems like I was talking about earlier with coffee and chocolate. Um, they also spend a lot of time in cattle pastures. If those cattle pastures have trees in them or if they have live fences that connect them to other forest patches, they actually create quite a bit of habitat for these birds that are coming down from the temperate area. So everything um, that occurs down here is really connected to other parts of the world. Um, even though we're um, a separate little section of the Smithsonian far away, um, a lot of the research that we do still uh, works with some of the same organisms, and a lot of the patterns that are found down here can also be applied to other areas, both in the tropics and then also in temperate areas. Thanks, Sunshine. I, I wanted to turn back to Alex for a moment. As you listen to um, each of our panelists speaking, um, I'm reminded of one of the questions that have, have come up uh, from our participants. And, and this one is, how do you observe a conversation like the one we're having now? And as you walk about your day and you think about oral histories, does, uh, what are some of the things you're hearing now that trigger opportunities to take an oral history? Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, this goes back to the question that, that you were asking earlier. How do you find people? And I see that there are a lot of connections here, um, you know, between 
say, someone who is a bird watcher in the United States who, who loves seeing those, those really attractive species that come up in the, in the summer and spring, and then to be able to connect those to the impact that they would have, uh, that land use changes in Central America would have on those birds. So I see that there are a lot of connections, and I think that um, that's one of the nice things that, that you explore once you start an oral history project. You, you ask one person uh, a set of questions, and you start listening to their answers, and then you realize, well, that leads to more questions, and they might mention other individuals who have other concerns that are related, and that could then go into uh, you know, a second or third uh, set of interviews. And um, you know, even um, what Cheryl's doing when she invites uh, these experts to come to her classroom, it's quite possible to um, videotape those uh, interactions with the students and then post them and then see who else on the Shout community might have a, an answer to a question that was posed by one of those experts or one of those people. So you don't have to do, uh, it doesn't have to be starting in a grandiose, large way. You can start very small and, and see how it builds. Now, is the oral interview itself the end of the story? Is it a raw material? Does it stand alone? How do you, how do you see the oral history in the broader context? Well, oral histories are the way, you know, most histories are written by the big names or the people who, who are well recognized. But oral histories are the histories of people themselves who have experienced history firsthand through their own eyes. And so you, um, you know, you don't want to just tape an interview and then throw it in the closet. You want to be able to share that interview with other people who might be interested. And, and certainly if there's a community that's um, of people who have a concern, say um, a community that's living on an area that's about to be uh, deforested or something and they want to talk about their way of life, um, you'd want to preserve what they have so that their children, their grandchildren, would be able to look back and see how their uh, ancestors lived and, and be able to understand the, the traditions that they come from. And so from that reason, it's very important when doing oral histories to sort of think about not just the immediate use, but, but the future use. And one of the first and most important things is, of course, to be completely open and honest with the people that you're taping that you are going to preserve this and to get their written permission. And again, all of those um, concerns and techniques are, are on our website. It's very easy to see step-by-step step what to do. But if you think about it just a little bit in advance, you'll be able to make an important document that would have meaning for not just the, the, you know, the people that you're trying to reach in your audience, but also for the people themselves in the, in the interviews. Did I answer your question there? Oh, so nobody could have heard any of that, huh? Because I was on mute the whole time. Well, there you go. They gave you all, all a chance. You, you were all so, so, so very patient and quiet, and I'm very sorry about that. I'm going to go back and see if Cheryl is there, because I was uh, inviting Cheryl to tell us a little bit about, um, about some opportunities that she had to do some recording in her classroom. Oh, yes. I'm sorry I did not hear what you were saying. No, that's my apology, we, not yours. Go ahead. We did a project last year with our grandparents, and all of the students in the classroom invited a grandparent or a great-grandparent to class to answer some questions about their childhood. We took those recordings and made them into a DVD for all the kids. So they have a video of the children interviewing their elders, 
and we actually sold those back to the families, and the kids used the money that they raised to donate to Christmas for Seniors here in our town. That was one project that we did. Is that the one you were referring to? Uh, that, and I also know you recorded a, a song, I think you mentioned, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we did. Uh, we did a song based on a Sing, Write, Learn uh, song that John Farrell created. The kids made it about the orangutans in Borneo. It was their way of of telling, trying to tell the world about it. We then used our blog and Twitter to put it out to the world. They got all kinds of feedback from around the world. And the orangutan outreach site posted it on their website and then gave the kids an orangutan adoption for the work that they did. And the expert in that one ended up being the superintendent of our school district who had lived in Indonesia and came in and talked about his experiences with orangutans while he was living there. Amazing. So... Um what I'd like to do now is we're getting close to the end of our, our time together, and I wanted us to go to the future uh, with our, our fellow participants online, and I want each person who's online with us to do the same thing. Um, I want us to imagine that we're holding this session in September 2111. That's 100 years from now. I want you to look around at the natural world that surrounds you right now or that's, uh, that, that you can see from wherever you are or outside the window. What changes do you see? hundred years from now, from where you're, you are today, um, or from where you spend your time or, or spend your time thinking about. Maybe we could ask for a few of our panelists to, to tell us what they see. Um, Gary? Yeah, th this is Gary. Um, what I see is a lot more people. Um, the, the human population is unfortunately growing at an alarming rate, um, and, and so somehow this earth is going to have to handle uh, that huge influx of people. I'm in Washington, D.C., a city, and I just see these cities getting a lot more dense, and I hope that's the case. I hope that's where all the people are going to end up instead of um, paving over more uh, wild lands to create more communities. I, I hope those that influx of people end up in, in cities, um, and that's what I see. What about you, Anna? Well, I do see a lot more people, um, but I also hope that you know some of the some of the area, some of the wildlands that have been destroyed and now are going through restoration processes. I hope that maybe um, we sort of found a way to live a little bit more harmoniously uh, with uh, wildlife and also with these um, these forests. And you know, maybe the forests now that seem like second or third uh, growth forest, or who knows how many growths over after being logged, they might be giant old growth forests. So I hope to see uh, you know more more wilderness, and uh, as well as more people living responsibly. Very nice. Uh, Jonathan? Well, I study climate change, and um, sadly, uh, I expect it will be quite a lot warmer and quite a lot more climate variability. And so I, I'm not sure we can imagine exactly the state of uh, the natural communities maybe any more so than we could have imagined what we see now, but um, I, I hope what the climate scientists are telling us now are enough for us to make the changes necessary to stabilize the climate system. Anyone else want to jump in on this 100-year uh, challenge question? Sure. Uh, this is Sunshine from Panama. Um, I'm in a unique situation because I live and I work in a community called Gamboa, which is, um, well, actually I'm sitting right now about 100 meters from the Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal is extremely important for the world economy, and the trees that surround the Panama Canal are extremely important for um, basically maintaining the canal processes. So if we cut down all of the trees, the canal would just become a muddy ditch. Um, so actually where I am, a lot of attention is focused on the ecosystem health and maintaining um, trees. But one thing that's been noticed by some of my colleagues here in the forest is that vines are overtaking trees at alarming rates. And the even primary tropical forest communities are really changing in the sense that instead of... Um, um, well, they're still dominated by trees, but vines are increasingly having uh, playing a bigger and bigger role. And what vines can do sometimes is really prevent smaller trees from ever reaching the canopy. 
So I suspect 100 years from now we're going to see a very viney, viney forest. Thanks, Sunshine. And um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up on the, the screen a uh, the drawing that our friend Chris has been capturing of your visions and your thoughts and um, uh, and your distinctions between different things that we've been drawing here today. So here's his drawing, um, and we'll see that coming up. Um, and Cheryl, what do you hope uh, some of your students will um, have contributed to this planet uh, or left behind 100 years from now? I hope that my students learn to love the, the nature aspect of our world. I hope that they... Sorry about the bell ringing. I hope that they learn to, to love the animals and the plants and to treasure and value them and always find a place for those in their life so that they can protect them as much as possible. Well, I, I hope you'll, you'll join me in thanking everybody um, who was part of this first run of the Shout uh, Conference Series and the Shout Learning Project overall. Um, and I would like to remind you that even though that this is the last session in our first year of Shout, year two, which will focus on environmental issues that surround water, will resume with a preview this coming December, and then our first online conference will take place in January. And meanwhile, you can follow the Shout program on shoutlearning.org, as well as follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash slash shout learning. So everyone, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope that we'll be hearing from all of you and all of our participants in the days, weeks, and years ahead. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank it was you. fun. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And if you're still with us, wanted to point out that you can also find on shoutlearning.org teacher resources from our Microsoft Partners in Learning community, a virtual global classroom from, for our students to continue their dialogue, uh, the oral history project, the tree banding project, and a wide array of resources. So please visit us at shoutlearning.org. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>